Welcome everyone. I'm Janet Sylvia with UGA's College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. And I support the webinar technology for UGA Cooperative Extension and would like to introduce you to the host of the webinar series. Dr. Dan Suter is a professor of urban pest management in the Department of Entomology at the University of Georgia. He's located on the UGA Griffin campus. Dr. Suter has worked with the pest control industry since 1987. And Dan would like to welcome you and introduce you to today's speaker. It's all yours, Dan. Thank you, Janet and, uh, and Jim. And welcome, everybody, uh, this morning. We have a very timely topic. Uh, we were we were talking before the webinar this morning about trying to barbecue this weekend. And I guess it was albopictus. I guess, Elmer, you'll tell us what was biting me. But I, I suspect it was albopictus. 80s albopictus wouldn't leave my ankles alone. So very timely <laughs> webinar this morning. But uh, yeah, this is our third in the series for this year. You've got a couple others that we've got a couple others that are coming up uh, uh, later in the year, and I hope you'll join us uh, for those. We have expanded to six states now, and uh, we give credit in in all of those states. I know we have folks joining us from North and South Carolina this morning, and probably some other states as well. So uh, what will happen is we'll uh, I'll get registration information from Gwen in the next few days, and we will. Uh, uh, submit that to the various states for credit. But our speaker this morning is, uh, is Mr. Elmer Gray. Elmer got his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in zoology from Clemson uh, back in 1985. And like Clemson so much, he stuck around and got a master's degree in medical and veterinary entomology in 1990. He, is a, uh, he works as a research entomologist in the Department of Entomology here at UGA now and uh, supports public health extension entomology. Uh, for the state of Georgia and, and essentially the southeast. Uh, he's an active member of the American Mosquito Control Association, and he's on the board of directors for the Georgia Mosquito Control Association. And they have their meeting coming up, I think, in Athens later this year. Uh, he's a uh, commercially licensed pesticide applicator in North and South Carolina, and he specializes in black fly suppression. This morning, of course, he's going to talk about mosquitoes. Uh, Elmer is a. Uh, an invited speaker all over the country and at the international level. In fact, we were talking a bit before the webinar about his travels, uh, his international travels here over the past couple of years. So I want you to welcome Elmer, and he's going to talk about mosquito biology, surveillance, and control. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Elmer, and you can tell us about mosquitoes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and included in this series. Um, mosquitoes is a very timely subject, as Dan has mentioned. It's gotten hot. We've had decent rainfall through uh, the last 18 months or so. So there's a fair amount of water standing around in places. And it's time with the temperatures heating up that mosquito development is occurring pretty fast. So I want get to get going. There's a lot, lot to cover. Mosquitoes are, are by far the most important blood-sucking arthropod. They transmit a lot of diseases. Uh, malaria is still the most problematic disease that mosquitoes transmit, and that occurs through uh, much of Africa. Dengue is a spreading dis viral disease, um, has increased its range tremendously in the last 20 to 30 years. West Nile virus, as we're all aware, has been uh, prevalent in the United States since 1999. We've had uh, large outbreaks as recently as 2012 in Georgia. Encephalitis, when we speak of that, we're primarily speaking of eastern equine encephalitis and um, lacrosse encephalitis. These are viral uh, diseases transmitted by mosquitoes. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. So anytime when that occurs, people are seriously ill and it's a, it's a serious situation. Oftentimes people don't realize that dog heartworm is transmitted by mosquitoes and it's actually one of the most, um, the largest economic impacts for mosquitoes across the southeast is the treatment of dogs for heartworms. So that's a very prevalent and common problem. And chikungunya is a new viral disease that is uh, spreading into the Caribbean. It's, it started in uh, India and Southeast Asia and has shown up in the Caribbean. And there are imported cases in Florida this year. And the important part of this is that it's transmitted by container breeding mosquitoes like the Aedes albopictus that Dan mentioned. So this could be very problematic and is a real concern. So that's a name that you're probably going to be hearing more of in the uh, days and months ahead. Mosquitoes have worldwide distribution. They're adopted 
adapted to a wide variety of habitats. We have approximately 63 species here in Georgia, and that's kind of uh, related to the, the variety of habitats we have, ranging from the mountains in the north to the tropical coastal plain in the south. And the other states of the southeast have similar um, levels of, of uh, species. Seasonally specific weather conditions are important to disease transmission cycles. That's really critical when we start talking about why we have West Nile outbreaks, why we don't, uh, and the other cases. It's, it's really related to how much water we have, how the temperatures coincide with this, whether spring arrives early and drought conditions take place. Uh, 2012, when West Nile was so prevalent, it was a very early spring. It was very dry. The mosquitoes and the birds were confined to similar habitats. It really got the cycle of disease transmission um, going early between the mosquitoes and the birds. So there was a lot of virus in the environment, and then it transferred over to the humans as the season progressed. Mosquitoes have been around for a really long time, over 100 million years. Um, and that plays into the questions I often get, oh, is a cold winter, will there be mosquitoes? Is it a warm winter, what will that do? Mosquitoes have adapted to a lot of um, variability in the environment. Consequently, one cold winter, one cold month um, is not going to have a tremendous effect on the populations. It's, uh, they're very highly adapted to, to a wide range of conditions. But primarily, you know, we deal with them in today's environment and world for their general nuisance that they cause and the problems they, they, they bring to our homes and neighborhoods. In the southeast, I think we all can understand that the mosquitoes have been around for over 100 million years. They've been a problem in the southeast for much of that time. The very earliest English settlers um, in Georgia, the Fort King George was constructed in 1721. There's journal notations from that time of how bad the mosquitoes were. Um, across Florida, I was reading yesterday about how the history of mosquito control in Florida and how uh, they have had a tremendous effect, as we all can imagine, on the uh, development and, and life uh, life of, of how people were living in, in Florida as well. So across the southeast, mosquitoes have been around a long time, a lot of, lot of uh, effect on our culture. The development of the rice culture led to uh, malaria and yellow fever being rampant across the southeast. And as early as 1817, the city of Savannah used tax monies to convert adjacent lands from wet field rice culture to dry field rice culture. So as early as the uh, you know, early 1800s, it was recognized that standing water and mosquitoes were a terrible nuisance. And they began to do things to try to, to moderate this. And this was the first time that tax monies were used for mosquito abatement. So it's really interesting that Savannah had a very early uh, play in the mosquito um, history. Characteristics of mosquitoes, you know, first and foremost, they all require standing water to develop. And that's really something, I know we've heard it before, but we, we really need to harp on that and, and, and have that in your mindset as you're out as, as businessmen trying to help clients. Uh, it's the standing water that we're looking for as homeowners, it's standing water. The adults are long-legged. Many of us are familiar with mosquitoes and how they look. Uh, they have one pair of wings. These are true flies, the diptera, order diptera. The second pair of wings is uh, modified into haltiers or small club-like structures that are used for balance, as opposed to a butterfly that has four wings. Beetles have four wings, the outer shells. So one pair of wings. They have scales on their wing margins and veins. This is important from a taxonomic standpoint. when when we're trying to identify what species it is, it's important that the specimens have all their scales on them. It's much easier to identify them through the keys when the specimens are intact and the scales are on the wings and thorax and such. Otherwise, they become what we describe as little brown jobs, and they're much more difficult to identify. In general, mosquito taxonomy with good specimens is, is, is reasonably easy to do in the, in the world of taxonomy. There's great keys available. There's training sessions conducted uh, from time to time. And mosquito taxonomy is a doable thing that I encourage everyone who's um, using this as a, as a business model to, to learn and, and, and understand because it's, it's very doable. It's not like trying to identify small beetles or some of the other small flies. 
Um, mosquitoes are very characteristic in their scale patterns and can be identified readily. So they have a long proboscis, and I think all of us are aware of the biting um, mouth parts of the mosquito. And the females require blood. This is really what brings them to our foremost um, interest is the females' biting habits. They require protein to produce their eggs, and this is the case with most of the biting flies. The mosquito life cycle, in general, the eggs are laid in rafts or singly and can hatch within 24 to 48 hours. With 63 species in the state of Georgia and across the southeast, many more, uh, there's going to be variety in, in, in all of these characteristics that I described. Um, Larval have four instars. That's something that runs across all the, all the species. They feed on microorganisms and organic matter. Um, the more material in the water column, the better the larvae grow and the more they have to feed on. The pupil, pupil stage, uh, let me see if I can work my pointer down here. Pupil stage is a transitional stage uh, where the mosquito is switching from the larval to the adult stage where they emerge onto the water surface. Um, the pupal stage is a non-feeding stage, a little bit more difficult to control in this very, very short period. The adult merges onto the water surface, and many of our mosquitoes don't fly that far. When, when you're having a problem in a client's home, look close first, identify the species, and you'll be able to have an idea of what kind of habitat, what kind of larval habitat they're going to be developing in, and where they may be coming from. It's not to say that those of you who, who are in coastal regions, the salt marsh mosquitoes have a tendency to travel great distances sometimes, so they can, can uh, problems can come from far, afar, but often in the upstate and in the Piedmont regions, our pest problems come from closer rather than far. Lifespan, uh, 10 days in the heat of the summer, up to six months, and that's because some of the species will overwinter as adults. Uh, the Culex mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus often overwinter in the storm drain systems and can uh, last several months in that habitat. Whereas in the heat of the summer, Aedes albopictus, when it's hot, nearly over 90 degrees, they're probably only going to live 10 to 14 days at the most. The cycle requires six days to months um, as when we're going from eggs to adult, and that's going to depend on the species and the conditions. Overnight temperatures play a lot into this. Um, when the night's temperatures go down, the water temperatures cool off where the larvae and pupae are developing, and that slows down development tremendously. So that in the heat of the summer, when the nights stay hot, the water temperature stays warm, and development occurs much faster. Just briefly on taxonomy, um, what I want to get to here is there's three subfamilies of mosquitoes. The culicinae is our most common, and that's what, what, where the larvae suspend from the water surface. And, that, and this includes our most common pest of Aedes albopictus and Culex quinquefasciatus and some of the others. The anopheline includes genus Anopheles. These are the malaria vectors, and the larvae are a little bit different that they lay upon or they lay horizontal at the water surface. And I have a great picture of this coming up. Um, so it, they, they look much different in the water column as opposed to the Culicinae larvae. The Toxyrhynchidae is a very large and predaceous. Um, species, the, the, the larvae are predaceous on other mosquito larvae. The females don't feed on blood, so they're not, not pests. Mosquito eggs, as I said, they're either laid individually or in rafts. A raft of mosquito eggs is about the size of a grain of rice and may include uh, 100 to 150 eggs. They're typically laid in protected areas. The eggs are not typically deposited in clean water, and that's something that really want to stress. Um, you put a put a clean bowl of water out for your dog, a female mosquito is not going to be attracted to it till 7 to 10 days when there's lots of algae growing in that bowl. And then they're going to be much more attracted to it when they can sense the food, the oviposition attractants, uh, as that water becomes kind of putrid and starts growing um, material on the surfaces. Clean water, they're not attracted to uh, maybe five days in the heat like this. That's why people talk about dumping out their uh, bird baths every five three to four days, something like that. Uh, some species will lay their eggs on wet soil. These are described as floodwater mosquitoes. Uh, not all the eggs will hatch at once. And um, this is pretty common. There's a lot of species that fall into this class. 
So as a, and when the river floods in your area, the water goes down, the mosquitoes will lay their eggs in this wet soil in the low-lying areas. The next flood, these, these eggs will hatch, some of these eggs will hatch, and the population will, will explode. This explains why we often have large outbreaks of mosquitoes after hurricanes. Water gets pushed up into areas that haven't had water in you know, six months to a year to two years, and there'll be a lot of uh, eggs hatch at that time. The hatching stimulus involved in this oftentimes is low oxygen, and this would go along with a lot of biological activity occurring in the water, and uh, that causes the eggs to hatch. They've, they've adapted to this and uh, kind of gives them an indicator that there's going to be food for the larvae to feed on. Obviously, there's a variety of um, things that are ways that this takes place amongst the different species. It's an example of, of individual eggs. These are probably uh, 80s Egypti eggs or similar to 80s Albopictus. Uh, very small, something that we don't typically see. Uh, uh, 80s Albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, will plaster these uh, just above the water surface in a bucket or a tire or something like that. Uh, but we don't very often see these even as entomologists. However, the egg raft, like a Culex mosquito would produce, we, we, we can see fairly readily. Um, it's about the size of a grain of rice. They start out a very creamy color, like so, like these eggs, and then they darken and will become almost black by the time they uh, are ready to hatch. So an egg raft, they're hydrophobic, so they'll basically be sitting very high on the water column, sitting right on the water surface. And is, is once you see them and recognize them, uh, when we see them, they'll typically be jet black from uh, being very close to mature to be ready to hatch. Okay, this is an example of the Culicinae larvae that I had mentioned. They are commonly called wigglers. Uh, there are four instars. The first instar is very small and very difficult to see in the field. We don't typically uh, see those as entomologists unless you're looking really close. It's the later third and fourth instars that were so common to see as is depicted in this image. When they're disturbed, they quickly dive from the surface of the water. So it's important when you're doing surveillance, looking for larvae, you, you come up with the sun kind of in your face. If you cast a shadow over a pool of water, the mosquito larvae are going to pick up that uh, change in, in sunlight and dive down into the water column. So that's something to think about when you're doing your surveillance. Don't have your shadow go over the water. Uh, otherwise, they'll, the larvae will dive and hide in the substrates. The head capsules defined, they breathe via an air tube or a siphon at the water surface. Uh, the numerous hairs and pectin on the larvae are, are used for identification purposes. And this is really where surveillance is the first step. When, when you get called to a mosquito problem, uh, you're going to capture the adults and you're going to get out and look for these larvae and try to figure out where they're developing. Control is important at this stage because they're developing in defined areas where um, you know, a small pool of water can have thousands of mosquito larvae. Once they emerge up out of it, those adults are spread out over the whole block. So it's much more difficult to control at that point. So it's really nice when you can find the larvae, knock them out at that stage before the adults start flying. Good, good image of a culicinae mosquito larvae. The pectin that I spoke of right here are part of the identification purposes. The air siphon, uh, where they breathe through the water surface. These are called, described as the anal papillae. They're involved with their osmoregulatory um, processes. Uh, the other hairs on the thorax and on the head down here are all part of the taxonomic um, characteristics that we use for identification. And again, there are good keys, a lot of keys available for the mosquito larvae, fourth instar mosquito larvae, and then the female mosquitoes, the female adult mosquito, the two things that we use uh, primarily for our taxonomic purposes. This is an example of the Anopheline larvae. They lay at the water surface. They don't have the air tube, um, and it's a different, different beast. Uh, when you disturb these water, they, they have a twitching motion. They typically stay kind of high in the water column, and they're twitching across the water surface. Not as common of a pest for us um, from a, a pest control purpose. They're going to be more in permanent waters, so we're not going to see them in neighborhoods as much, but they're very important as far as malaria and um, can be tremendous pests in some areas where there's large bodies of standing water. Larval habitats, essentially any still water that has few fish. And that's something I really want to stress is, is people don't really understand that you know, the, the, the typical farm pond that's full of fish, 
doesn't produce very many mosquitoes. There may be a few produced in the grass around the edges, but in general, if there's fish there, fish are great predators. Um, whether it's the mosquito fish, Gambusia finis, which is a top feeding minnow and has been spread around the east uh, for mosquito suppression and is a great choice in certain habitats, to brim uh, or sunfish that we, we often consider sport fish. <coughs> They're very good predators as well. They just don't tolerate as poor water quality. The Gambusia um, top feeding minnows can, can really develop in poor water that's kind of nasty and wouldn't hold uh, most fish populations. <coughs> the, there's always a suitable food source available, uh, bacterial, fungal, algal. Algae are really a big part of the uh, mosquito larvae diet, as they are a lot of other aquatic insects, and suspended organic material. The Culex mosquitoes that develop in the storm drains and in uh, uh, the, the pools or um, lagoons, sewage lagoons associated with hog farms and stuff like that uh, will often support large populations of the Culex mosquitoes they develop in the water with uh, a lot of organic material. Often these times, the habitats that mosquito larvae are used will be protected from wind and waves and predators. That's often provided by emergent vegetation in the wetland environments. Um, the mosquitoes look for them along the edges. They're not going to be out in the wide open where the mosquito fish and other predators can get them. They're going to be on the edges where there's protection um, for a number of reasons. That allows the adults to emerge up onto the water surface and provide some protection from the other predators. Containers are always problematic as far as larval habitats are concerned. Used tires are one of our most common uh, habitats in the, um, around our homes and neighborhoods. Uh, the, the use of tire abatement and, and programs where tires are taken in by counties and cities are great uses of our, our funds and tires should really be focused on. If you see tires in uh, your client's yard, the neighbor's yards, you can almost be assured that, that there will be mosquito development there. Buckets, obviously tarps are something people don't really think about. Uh, I burn firewood. If you've got tarps, there w will be water captured in, some, in them somewhere, especially associated with boats. Um, tarps and boats really together are, are big producers of mosquitoes. Any kind of litter. Abandoned pools have been a, a big problem with the downturn in the economy, houses going up for foreclosure, and the pools get left behind. Um, there's a variety of products that can be used. Mosquito fish can be used, um, but, but abandoned pools need to be focused on. <coughs> Any item that can hold water <coughs> is critical. Mosquito pupae are commonly called tumblers, and that's describing their movement from the water column. Left undisturbed, they'll, they'll stay at the water surface. Uh, they have uh, respiratory trumpets that or respiratory horns that they use to breathe at the water surface. They have two body regions, the cephalothorax thorax, and the elongated abdomen with terminal paddles. This is short stage. This is a transitional stage, as I mentioned, from the larvae to adult. When you see pupae, you know you're going to have adults soon. So you need to uh, use some of the surface film products to that will suffocate them. Um, and be prepared because you don't have time to leave that job and come back next week. They'll, they will already be emerged. So when you see pupae, you need to treat it uh, very quickly with one of the products that are effective against them. Um, they don't feed, so they can't. We can't control them through the use of BTI or the other some of the other biological control agents. Great image here of, of pupae. The respiratory trumpets right here. Uh, you can see that the head of the Mosquito curled up in here with its wings and the rest of the abdomen down through the uh, lower part with the terminal paddles down below. So it's a resting transitional stage and the adult mosquito will emerge up onto the water surface. This is an example of what, what pupae are going to look like in a bucket or a container. You know, when you, when you see this, you don't think mosquitoes typically. And it's important for you folks to have an eye for this now. Um, remember, they're called tumblers. So when they're disturbed, they're going to kind of tumble down into the water column. Um, but they're very characteristic looking. But, but when you see that, most people don't associate these to uh, the adult mosquitoes that will soon follow. 
Adult emergence, the pupae are lighter than water due to an air bubble in the cephalothorax. The skin splits. They rise to the water's surface. And this is where pr the protected area is critical. They're not going to be out in the middle of the pond. They're going to be around the edges where there's emergent vegetation uh, to protect them from winds and waves. Um, when we're doing surveillance and you capture males, that indicates that the larval habitat is very close by. Um, this is something where you know the, the males aren't going to be attracted to us, so they're not going to come to us biting. They're going to feed on nectar from flowers. Um, but if we do capture them, uh, the larval habitat is close, so you need to look look close. They're not far away. Great, great series of pictures of just how the mosquito rises to the water surface. A couple things I want to point out. One, I mentioned the Toxorhynchites uh, subfamily of mosquitoes. And you'll see here that the proboscis is curved. This is a mosquito that feeds on flowers and does not blood feed on, on any kind of uh, host. So as far as, as, you know, if there's a good mosquito, this can be it right here. The larvae are predaceous on other mosquito larvae, and the adults don't blood feed. So that's, that's how lone good mosquitoes are toxoronchites. Again, uh, the eggs are laid on water with some biological activity. If there's algae and stuff in the water, that's something that should catch your eye. The larvae like to feed on algae. They can go from egg to adult. We're in the heat of the summer now, and six days and under with ideal food conditions. And uh, temperatures, seldom less than that. Um, adults don't typically fly far. There are exceptions. The salt marsh mosquitoes along the coast will move great distances, up to 20 miles. But when we're in the upstate, the Piedmont regions, Oftentimes, our pests are coming from nearby, so, so don't look afar or look close. The females bite to acquire protein for egg development. They often have preferred hosts. The Culex mosquitoes typically prefer to feed on birds. That's why the West Nile virus cycle is a bird to mosquito cycle. And then at, towards the end of the summer, they have a tendency to branch out and feed on other hosts. Oftentimes, they'll bite horses or humans. We're described as dead-end hosts, where we don't develop enough virus in our um, in our system for the mosquito to pick it up and transfer it to someone else. But the, the birds develop very high viremia. They have a lot of virus in their blood. The mosquito bites them, can take the virus to another host. The cycle is driven by temperatures and food avail availability. And the populations typically develop and build through the summer. Uh, as the nights stay hot, the populations, they grow faster and faster. And that's why the typical peak for West Nile virus transmission in the southeast is mid-August to mid-September, early August to the, to the end of September, basically. Um, so, so that's still ahead of us. And it really depends on what conditions occur between now and the end of the summer as to whether we'll have a lot of West Nile virus transmission or not. Wide range of habitats, all or some version of standing water. Each species has a specific type habitat. Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, that's such a pest, prefers containers. Aedes vexans is a floodwater mosquito. And if you have a lot of them showing up in a neighborhood, maybe the river flooded two weeks prior and there's a lot of standing water along in the swamps. Uh, if you have a lot of anopheles in a neighborhood, there may be permanent water, a big swamp down the road. Even tree holes. We don't think about this, but there's an, actually a species that uh, is specifically develops and prefers developing tree holes, Aedes triceriatus. So there's a number of uh, habitats, but any version or site with standing water, it can be a, a problem. The biggest thing you want to point is, is uh, as, as you guys get out there or people get out there and start looking around and, and get called to a mosquito problem, look down. And I don't mean look down at your feet. I mean look down the hill. The, the, you know, water flows downhill. And look for the low spot. Look where the water's going to be flowing to when it rains hard. It's going to run off somewhere, and then it's going to stop. Whether it's in the storm drain system, whether it's in the swamp at the bottom of the hill, whether it's at the downspout. Uh, but look down. The water's going to flow down, and eventually it's going to stop and stand somewhere, and that's where the mosquito larvae are going to be developing. And the choice of larvicide that we can use to control the mosquitoes uh, is oriented to the type of site that we're being treated, whether it's a grassy wetland or whether it's an open <coughs> um, sheet water you know, flood area. Uh, the choice of larvicide as far as the active ingredient and the formulation is oriented to the type of site that will be treated. 
I like to use this image because this is a, a shot about 30 feet above a salt marsh down in Brunswick, near Brunswick, Georgia. And the dark area in this pool are mosquito larvae and pupae. So you could imagine the mosquitoes that can come off of salt marsh when, when there's so many larvae that you can see them from 30 feet above in the helicopter. You'll notice that there's another spot over here. Um, just tremendous population. So salt marshes uh, are always a problem. And our most developed mosquito control programs occur along the coast from Massachusetts to Florida, all the way around the Gulf Coast. Uh, New Jersey is where some of the earliest mosquito control started. And that's related to it being a peninsula with salt marshes all around it. Roadside ditches. Uh, this is a case of poor drainage. This, this ditch was, was rutted out. This is near my home in Oglethorpe County. Uh, you can see how green the grass is. It's been a wet wet summer and the water's trapped in the ditch and this, this ditch was full of 80s vexans, the floodwater mosquito. Retention ponds. This is something that needs to be, uh, we need to pay attention to them but, but also there, there's a word of caution here. Um, retention ponds are a great thing as, as we've, we've learned it allows, it prevents flooding and runoff, slows down runoff, allows water to recharge the groundwater systems. Um, however, they're often developed and left, and then no one's left to be responsible for them. However, I've, I've looked in a lot of these, and oftentimes there'll be a mosquito problem in the neighborhood, and they say, oh, there's that retention pond down at the corner, and that, that must be where they're all coming from. And I'll go in here and look, and there'll be a few Anopheles larvae, and there'll be um, some other types of larvae. Oftentimes there'll be some kind of minnows that are already in these. And like I said, if there's fish in them, if you walk up to this, this retention pond and the grass go, and the fish go scurrying out of, uh, swimming out of this grassy areas, it's probably not the big problem. The, the, the times that I was called in neighborhoods and that were pointed out to me, oftentimes it was 80s albopictus developing in debris in people's yards that was the problem, and it was not the retention pond. But these are good sites for mosquito fish. It's not a natural fish habitat. Uh, Oftentimes, these will drain down or, or dry down in the summer. It will be very poor water quality. The mosquito fish can tolerate that. They're very effective, and it's a great site for them. And this, this retention pond is in Athens and is actually my stocking pond that I use to grow mosquito fish in and transfer them to other sites. <coughs> this is from an old neighborhood in Atlanta. <coughs> There's a storm drain that pours out below here and blows this area out, makes a pool, and this site was infested with, with QX larvae. And, and you look at that, you know, you see there's a lot of color in the water, a lot of color in the water indicating there's a lot of algae development and growth, and it's a great habitat for mosquito larvae. Easy to treat, but can be very productive. Storm drains. This is a, a site that was not a primary concern of mosquito control people in the past. But with the development of West Nile virus and the discovery that the Culex mosquitoes really like to develop into storm drain systems, there's been a lot of focus on storm drains and a lot of formulations of the larvicides have been developed, whether it's the methoprene or the BTI briquettes. They can be dropped in these and very effective at suppressing the populations. But storm drains are something that definitely should be focused on around retirement homes and around schools, places where, where young and old uh, can be exposed to the QLEX populations, they should definitely be targeted. Um, the corrugated pipe from our downspouts can be productive for Aedes albopictus. Any kind of drain system in low areas, as it, once again, you're looking down, you find a drain, oftentimes these will be clogged with, with uh, organic matter and water and can be very pr productive. Uh, a site like this where grass clippings are getting um, dispersed onto standing water, that's added nitrogen and growing algae and will grow mosquitoes. Um, I was called to a site near Monroe, Georgia, couldn't find significant habitats and they had, they had good populations of Aedes albopictus and the only thing we could figure is that the corrugated pipes were producing them, we would find them around the uh, drain downspouts from the gutters. So downspouts, any kind of gutters, um, looking down, you're looking where the water's flowing to. Abandoned pools, as I mentioned, 
Uh, here, here, this is a double dipper. You got the tarp, uh, which will hold water always and can be very productive. And then the stand, the pools themselves. Um, Richmond County and the Augusta area has had a great program where they've been very diligent to enforce regulations and um, standards to prevent people from having abandoned pools, uh, making people be responsible for these habitats. They're highly productive and can produce just millions upon millions of mosquitoes. Used tires, as I said, the water gets in them, it stays in them, they're black so they will heat up and stay warm so they, they, it speeds up the life cycle. The best way to do surveillance with these is with a bright flashlight and shine the light in there and then see if you see the larvae move around. Um, I've been involved in a couple different projects related to tires and that was what I found best. Rather than using a dipper or something to go in and stirring up the water in the tire and then not being able to see what's there, you just shine in there, sneak up on the tire, shine in with a bright flashlight and you can see the larvae pretty readily. This is an image from Dan from last summer, which we I think has been shared around the area. And uh, he found that there was over 6,000 mosquito larvae in one frying pan. And I think that kind of says it all. It doesn't take much of a habitat to produce tremendous populations. So there's 6,000 mosquito larvae in the pan, and those adult mosquitoes will cover the whole block once they emerge. So there you go. You can tip this over, and you've eliminated a habitat and gotten rid of a lot of mosquitoes. For nothing. Possible diseases in Georgia. You know, this this could be a whole semester right here, so uh, I'm not really going to do them justice. I did mention the West Nile virus. Eastern equine encephalitis is typically a disease more prevalent from the fall line and down in the more coastal areas. The mosquito, it's a bird mosquito cycle um, that takes place in the freshwater swamps when there's high water uh, levels. There will often be cycles going on, transmission cycles going on. Horses are often affected in these areas. It's a very serious disease. If it's children are exposed to it, uh, has a high fatality rate, and we don't recover completely from it. There again, you see both the encephalitis, West Nile causes encephalitis as well. Again, that's inflammation of the brain. Um, not many people get sick by these diseases, but when they do, oftentimes they don't recover fully. It's very serious. Lacrosse encephalitis affects children at a high rate. It's a, a bird and chipmunk or rodent cycle where the mosquito, the, the rodent will have a high level of virus. Uh, the mosquitoes feed on it, transfer it to other rodents, and can cross over and, and give it to children. Dog heartworm, as I mentioned, malaria, chikungunya. Chikungunya, I really want to stress that that's coming. Uh, it's occurring in Florida in imported cases right now. It's transmitted by the container breeding mosquitoes, mosquitoes and um, will, be, will be difficult to control or suppress when it gets here. So the, being diligent, the diligence that's required for these container breeding mosquitoes is what's going to help prevent and re reduce the risk of chikungunya coming forward. West Nile virus, um, 2012 it was all the rage. As I mentioned, we had a warm, a very early spring. It was warm. It was dry basically across the country. It occurred in all 48 contiguous states, which is unprecedented for a mosquito-borne virus. Uh, Georgia had over 100 cases with six deaths. South Carolina had over 30, or had 30 cases about with three deaths. You'll notice the counties in Georgia where it's most common is where the most, where the old city areas, uh, Darty County is Albany, uh, Muscogee, Cobb, DeKalb, and Fulton, that's, that's the old part of Atlanta. Um, the old storm drains in the older cities are where the Culex mosquitoes often develop. The, the cycle is ongoing there. It's endemic. It occurs regularly every year. And then it's just a matter of what the seasonally specific conditions are as to whether it, it, it comes out and has uh, problems for the rest of the area. 2013, not so much. There's only 10 cases in Georgia. And as 2014, up to this point, uh, I'm not aware of any cases, which is kind of unusual. Uh, but as I said, last summer we had we were over 10 inches ahead in rainfall. Um, we're over an inch ahead right now, so it's been wet. This flushes out the storm drain systems in the old cities. Um, will help reduce the Culex populations. It helps keep the transmission rates down as far as the West Nile virus. It's a bird mosquito cycle. 
one out of five people exposed to the virus will show any effects. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, when it becomes encephalitis, it's very serious. And the thing here is, is um, if you have a fever, you know, you can be sick in the summer, but if, but if someone seems disoriented, they seem kind of in a stupor, they don't see themselves from the standpoint of, of um, their, their mental acuity and how sharp they are, that's something that really need to get to the doctor quickly. That would be indicative of, of the encephalitis starting, uh, serious inflammation in the brain lining. So any kind of stupor or disorientation should really catch your attention. It's not a matter of just being sick in the summer, having a little fever, that's one thing, but being disoriented, um, losing the mental acuity is something that people should really be aware of. And preventing mosquito bites is the key. That's really where we go forward as far as us workers and people out doing stuff or as homeowners being gardeners, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, recommends using Environmental Protection Agency registered materials. Uh, being a public health entomologist, I'm really, this is really something I harp on. You get a lot of ideas and, and concepts of, oh, you know, bounce dryer sheets and all these things, garlic and bananas, and, you know, that just doesn't cut it. When, when you're under threat of disease transmission, you need to use a real repellent that's been tested and approved. DEET is still the gold standard. Picaridin is a product that's used in Europe. It's, and these are the active ingredients of, of repellents. There's a wide variety of, of products formulated with these things. Oil of lemon eucalyptus, that catches people's eyes as being a natural product, but uh, is only approved for, for children as young as three years of age. The thing with with D is it's approved for children as young as two months of age, and that's really why I'm a fan of it. I'm a parent. Uh, a little bit goes a long ways. Complete coverage is critical. When when you when you're putting on a repellent, whether it's adult or children, um, you want to make sure you get all your exposed skin. If you prefer not to use repellents, light colored, loose fitting clothing will help prevent mosquito bites. Light colored, as in the tan and khaki stuff that we often wear as work clothes, is great. Uh, loose fitting, so that mosquitoes can't bite through it. <clears throat> now, I know it's hot now, so that certainly comes into play, but <clears throat> these, are, these are ways that we can help prevent mosquito bites uh, not using repellents. So, but, but, but we need to prevent the bite. If you want to avoid mosquito-borne diseases, prevent the bite. <clears throat> Permanone, I, I want to point here to this second um, bullet. Permanone is, is permethrin, and it's for clothing only for, for workers. This can be used on our pants and shoes to help prevent ticks and chiggers and mosquitoes. And it's a great product to use in combination with DEET. If you're in areas where there's a, a serious mosquito population, um, permanone on the clothes and DEET on the skin. And, and as with always, um, Follow the labels. I think that's very common, commonly understood for you folks. Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, has become one of Georgia's most common pests, and that's across the southeast. That's not just Georgia. Uh, it was imported into Houston and used tires. You know, you know, it's hard to explain the wisdom of that, but it happened. Uh, and it's a very distinct mosquito. This is a daytime biter. Um, it's active probably the first two hours of the morning, last two hours of the day. Uh, when you get home from work and you're on your deck or in your garden, this is the guy who usually bites you, or girl who usually bites you. Um, <clears throat> they like to feed lower on our body. They'll often be down around your ankles, as Dan mentioned earlier. Uh, they're aggressive daytime biters. They have a limited flight range. Oftentimes it's, it's you know 300 feet, the length of a football field. Um, they're difficult to control with normal adulticide applications because they are active during the daytime when in the heat of the day when um, the adulticide would, would drift upward away from the mosquito habitats in the, in the, vape, or, uh, the heat of the day. Culex quinquefasciatus, the southern house mosquito. This is the primary vector of West Nile virus, occurs in storm drains. Uh, when you're doing mosquito control, any kind of standing water in storm drains should be evaluated for larval development. Oftentimes, it'll be this one, and it should be targeted. There's a variety of products. The, the briquettes are very effective for that. 
Coastal areas are often affected by hordes of the black salt marsh mosquito, Claritatus tenorhynchus. Um, tremendous pests. Can, these mosquitoes can travel great distances and are best targeted with barrier treatments around properties where you apply bifenthrin or permethrin, deltamethrin to vegetation uh, around a, a home or neighborhood where the mosquitoes rest during the heat of the day. Uh, they're often targeted by mosquito control districts uh, with, with aerial adulticide. The Gallinipper serophora ciliata. This is our, one of our largest mosquito species. We have a hurricane, and people often talk about these imported mosquitoes. No, it's, it's a floodwater mosquito. The populations come and go. You can see the scales on the legs are very shaggy, makes them look very large. The body itself is large, larger than most mosquitoes. Uh, it's a floodwater mosquito. It's common. It's out there. They're aggressive pests. Um, pretty common. <coughs> Integrated mosquito management, <clears throat> there's five pillars to it, education and communication, surveillance, source reduction, larviciding, and adulticiding. All of these are extremely important, and it starts with, with things like today where we're trying to get everyone up to speed on what to look for uh, and, and what to teach their clients to look for. Surveillance is the, the process of getting out there and looking for habitats. Mapping is essential when you get in, go into a neighborhood. Um, pay attention to where the mosquitoes are developing because they'll probably be developing in the same places next year. So you can map it out. You'll have areas for your technicians to go look, uh, and that builds upon itself, and it will help increase your efficiency. Source reduction, whether these habitats can be eliminated through improved drainage, dumping out the frying pan, or uh, you know they need to be targeted for treatment with larvicides. Uh, as we've described, the populations are concentrated for larvicide applications, and it's a great way to do it. Adulticiding is extremely important. It's still very effective. Um, it's, it's extremely important when disease tr transmission is the primary concern. You know, education, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. As you know, we, there's a lot of stuff on the Internet, these training sessions today. Uh, it's important to have trained personnel so they can get out and educate the public and your clients. Um, the large mosquito control districts or even towns and communities use a lot of different things, public events. Uh, mailing, Athens uses mailing inserts with their water bill, bills, door hangers, school visits. We feel like educating our children in the schools is one way we can get into homes about el eliminating standing water. Sometimes it's easier to educate the children than it is the parents. So that's a, that's a venue that we think is still uh, ripe for more development and, and improvement. Surveillance is the act of actually searching for the mosquito habitats. And this is uh, critical to any successful program. If you've got adults, you need to find out what they are. You can look up the biology very easily and then find, give you an idea where to look for the larval habitats, identify the larval specimens, you know where to target. In general, look for containers, low-lying areas, as I've described. Adult surveillance is a little bit more involved. Uh, there's a variety of traps that are often used to, for disease surveillance programs. But, but to, to a small operator, a sweep net, you know, catch the adult mosquitoes that are causing a problem in a yard, identify them. Uh, mapping is important to help visualize where these populations are developing. As I said, mapping the, the larval habitats in the neighborhood or around the home, and then uh, it's also important to help developing, you know, targeting how your suppression efforts are being applied. L um, the surveillance is work. This is where the work comes in as far as mosquito control. This is actually that blowout from below the storm drain down in Atlanta. Uh, put on hip boots, got in there, and found the larvae. And this is the mosquito dipper. It's a common surveillance tool. And you'll notice in this dipper that there's a pupae here and a pupae here. That means the rest of these mosquito larvae are going to pupate soon, and this population, the adult mosquitoes, will be coming off in the coming days. So it needs to be targeted very quickly um, with a control effort. <coughs> Source reduction is the process of eliminating standing water. It's 100% effective. It's usually cost efficient. This was the earliest form of mosquito control. Uh, ditching was very common on the salt marshes outside of New York City 
as people moved into the surrounding areas of New Jersey uh, from New York. You need to be environmentally aware. Um, draining salt marshes uh, has been a problem in the past. Obviously, now we realize how important swamps are to the ecology of, of uh, our water cycles. So that's something that, that needs to be aware. Uh, drainage is good to eliminate and keep move water moving, but um, some some places water needs to be left to, to stand and, and recharge the water system. And we can use other products and, and methods for mosquito suppression in these areas. Larviciding, if we can't remove a, a larval habitat, there's a lot of great products available today that can be used for mosquito control. Uh, the formulation and, and active ingredient that we use to target the habitat are as varied, varied as the habitats themselves. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Israeliensis, is a biological control agent that's very effective and is a product of choice. But there are a number of other things that are very good. Bacillus spiricus, spinosad, methoprene is an insect growth regulator that's been used for many years and is very effective. Um, there are surface films. Uh, in the old days, they used diesel fuel to, on, a, on a swamp. That's not the way we do it today. But there are refined um, alcohols and, and mineral oils that can be used as surface films and are good for pupil uh, suppression. Adult deciding is very effective when done properly. This is something that uh, often got a bad knock when West Nile showed up. I hated to see, oh, adult deciding is not, not an efficient or effective way to suppress mosquitoes. That's not true. Adult deciding is effective. It, it, it is necessary in some areas. If you live down by the Okefenokee Swamp in a small town, you can't larviside the whole swamp. Um, you're going to need to do adult deciding in your neighborhood if you want to go outside and enjoy your house on weekends. So uh, it only controls the adult mosquitoes that are present and that come in contact with the adult side droplets. So that is the knock against adult deciding is it's a temporary suppression of the adult population. A lot of research has gone on to this in the last you know, 30 years um, to, to make it more specific, uh, to reduce the non-target effects. It's important that uh, adult deciding the devices, the, the foggers that we use, are calibrated and are tested to make sure that they produce the proper size droplets. And I think all of us are aware of the concerns with honeybees. And beekeeper concerns and communications are extremely important if adult deciding operations are going to be done. Um, there are things that can be done by the beekeepers to prevent um, problems with, with adult deciding operations. They can cover their hives. As operators, we can avoid the areas uh, most where, where the bees are being kept to some degree. Um, the organophosphate products are probably more problematic to bees than some of the permethrin products that can be used. So there are things that, things to be aware of there and trying to remediate that problem. Uh, from an operator standpoint, adult deciding is our most common um, form and is very visible. So it's something where we want people to be trained completely and effectively. As small operators, the small handheld foggers are very effective and very good. And we, we, you know, if you can eliminate the larval habitats in an area or, or reduce them and then do adult deciding with handheld foggers, it can be uh, very effective. Looks like I'm getting short on time. Barrier treatments are another thing um, that, are, that are good for small operators. And this is where we can treat the, the vegetation around uh, homes and yards and ball fields. This is where the mosquitoes hide during the heat of the day. Um, try to target and get, get an even coat on the undersides of the vegetation where the mosquitoes will hide. And it's been reported to 14 to 21 days of residual activity. Um, there's research being done to verify this now. But the products uh, available that are commonly used in pest control are, are good for this uh, work and have, are labeled for it. So this is something to be aware of. And that's just an example of, of what operators are doing now, getting the vegetation. English ivy is often a, a, a good resting area for uh, the Aedes albopictus species. So that's something to be targeted. So in review, semi-aquatic insects 
do everything we can to uh, eliminate standing water. Uh, the rate of development is dependent on food availability and temperature, and each species has preferred habitats and hosts. Uh, they fly various distances depending on the species. Uh, you know, diligence is required. Identify the pest species as with all of your operations. Larvicide when you can. The barrier sprays are effective. Adult deciding is very effective. It's short-term relief. And there's a variety of foggers available that can suit most anyone's needs from handheld to truck-operated devices. And I'm going to wrap it up there. I'm going to have a few minutes for questions. In suburban neighborhoods, can breeding sites be moist to wet soil, or must we have only look for standing water? And how far away from only the customer's property? <laughs> only standing water. There's got to be water involved. If an, if an area is going to dry up in less than seven days, it's not going to be a concern. Uh, how far? Initially, I would look in that first 300 feet, the 100-yard area. Uh, that's going to be related to the pest species that you find. But look close first, and then reach out greater distances. Um, adult specimens can be identified. Uh, they can be sent to me. I can look at specimens for people. But as I said, there's a lot of great keys available to, to uh, help with the identification purposes. Good. And some of these I'm sure you've answered. Uh, the minimum number of days for the most common mosquito in Georgia needs to have in standing water? That's going to be around six days or so, five days maybe at the least. So, so uh, they can develop quick when it's hot like this. Right. And then uh, we've talked about tarps and small plastic ponds. Um, does turning over buckets kill the larvae? I think you've answered that. Absolutely. Kills them immediately. Um, since they feed on birds, how high from the ground can they fly or rest on trees, etc.? cetera? Uh, great question. Uh, what, what their preferred host is is going to uh, affect where they will, where their harborage will be. The Culex mosquitoes that often feed on birds will be up higher in the trees. The Aedes albopictus, which often feeds on small rodents and small animals, will be down low. That's why the English ivy, any yard that has English ivy in it, it dense vegetation down low, uh, that's an area that you may would want to target with a, a barrier spray. Good. And then Yvonne wanted you to explain the different formulations to use in different sites. Um, that may be a little more extensive than we have time here. Uh, anything you want to just do a short one on? Um, bifenthrin has been has been in the literature as being very good for the barrier sprays. So, so barrier sprays with bifenthrin or permethrin, deltamethrin are all going to be effective. Uh, larviciding, um, you want to use a granular formulation for areas with lots of grass so that you get better spread. You don't want to throw a briquette in a in a vegetation choked pond because that larviside is only going to disperse a short distance around it. So use granular formulations of larviside when you have larger areas of vegetation to cover. If it's open water, you can spray with the liquid formulations. Should a service technician spray a regular pesticide in a container that has mosquito larvae and pupae? Uh, we always want to follow the label, so I would recommend no. You need to you need to use the larval side. If if it can't be dumped, if you can dump it, just just eliminate it that way. Okay, and what active ingredient formulation have you seen the best results for uh, mosquito reduction this year with the backpack blowers? Not something that I've studied recently. As I said, it, bifenthrin's in the literature as being very good, but that will be there's there's studies ongoing to see just what the residual product or residual length is on that. Um, but but any of the labeled products seem to be effective. So I think there's a wide range of products. Uh, that if people have certain preferences of or supplies of, if they're labeled for residual mosquito control, they will be effective. We don't, we're not aware of any resistance problems right now, so uh, most all the formulations that are labeled for mosquitoes will be effective. Um, this one, I'll try to make sure we get it across to you. What do you do with trees that bear fruits or nuts that is too close to the house or structure? Had a customer telling me that they spray pesticides themselves on trees, so why we, the PMPs, do not or cannot spray it? 
Okay, I think we're going to run into label stuff there. Obviously, if you got fruit trees, you need to only apply what products are labeled for that fruit and the harvest intervals and things like that. So that's something to definitely be aware of. And we've got to follow those labels closer. All of us will get in trouble. And can you touch base on what type of fish do you use and, and perhaps where they can, uh, how they obtain those? Okay, Gambusia finis is the mosquito fish. It's fairly common across the southeast. Um, I actually have a pond here in Athens that have a, has a healthy population. The, there's fisheries across South Georgia that will sell them. Uh, however, they won't transport them in the heat of the summer. So I think we're a little bit behind the eight ball on that one. The heat, you know, it's hard to move fish in the hot weather. But if you're in the, in the upstate of Georgia, uh, there, there are fish available through the Extension Service. You, know, you can contact me at this email address, and maybe we can get hooked up that way. Okay. And when you were talking about the repellents, you uh, didn't comment on IR3535. Can you just touch on that? Uh, yeah, I believe that's a synthetic uh, product that has proven to be effective. It's approved by EPA. And... Um, it's not real commonly available, though. That's, that's one of the reasons I mentioned it, is when you go to the store, I don't think you're going to find many products that have it listed as the active ingredient. Um, so DEET and picaridin, oil of lemon, eucalyptus are the three things that you can find commonly. Um, and, and, and I highly recommend the proper use of repellents if you're out working or uh, you have children out in areas where there's mosquito populations. You wash them off when you come inside. They're very effective and very safe. Very good. When you're talking about flight distance, is that from the breeding site or is that the feeding range? Uh, good question. Typically when we talk about flight distance, it's going to be from uh, where the mosquito emerges from. So if, if they emerge someplace, it's how far they go from it. But um, th there's going to be a lot of variability in that and it's going to involve what the topography is, whether it's open, whether it's hilly, vegetated. Uh, but 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 I just want to stress: look close. If you've got a client with a problem, oftentimes they're coming from closer than than you realize. And uh, Caleb wants to know: with small municipalities losing funding for mosquito control programs, what can PMPs do to, as far as surveil surveillance, placing gravid traps or New Jersey, and where do you send specimens in Georgia? Okay. Um, First off, it is a problem with, with this communities losing funding or reducing funding. So there's a role, going to be an increased role for the pest control operators. Surveillance, you know, I would, if, if you've got someone who has a problem, do surveillance uh, on the edge of the vegetation. Um, edge habitats, like with wildlife, are often the, the best places to do surveillance. Um, now, samples can be sent. I can receive them. Uh, Miss Lisa Ames with the Extension Service, but now we we're going to look at individual samples. We're not looking to there, there's not a um, mechanism to look at you know trap entire trap catches for operators. At, at that point, they need to um, train up on the adult identification and have someone on staff who can do it. There are training sessions held through Florida. Uh, Georgia is not having any training sessions this year. Hopefully this winter we'll be able to have something. Okay. And can you briefly discuss how new regulations may affect adult treatments with, with synthetic pyro, pyrethroids? Um, I know that for the pest control industry there's uh, some changes in regulations. I'm not aware of how they're going to affect mosquito control. Uh, other than, than, you know, following the labels. I don't think it's going to have a huge problem uh, as far as treating vegetation and the barrier treatments. I don't think it's having, going to have an effect on the mosquito aspect. But that's something that uh, the Georgia Pest Control Association is probably a great way to follow uh, the changes in those regulations. Very good. Well, that takes us through our list of questions that were on the chat box. You can see Elmer's email address on the screen. And let me turn it back over to Dan to wrap us up. Nice webinar, Elmer, and uh, uh, a lot of good information. If anybody has any follow-up questions for Elmer, you do see his email address there. If you have any questions on 
on credit and in the uh, submission of of credit forms to the various states. I know we have several people here from North Carolina who need to get their credit in. And uh, folks in South Carolina, you can email me or call me. Uh, my email address is dsuter at uga.edu, or you can call me at 770-233-6114, and I'll answer any questions you might have uh, regarding submission of credit. But we appreciate it, Elmer, and uh, thanks, everybody, for attending, and hope you'll attend the next one coming up in a couple months on the subterranean termites. It'll be one hour WDL. Anyway, hope uh, everybody has a great mosquito season, and uh, we'll see you around the state. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, people. Appreciate your participation. Thank you.